Hi everyone and welcome to Diabetics for Diabetics, the go-to place for all things current diabetes research, both type 1 and type 2, where we are not just going through the literature, but also connecting dots on the multiple facets of diabetes and talk about how we can take what we're learning from these papers and actually implement them in our everyday lives with diabetes. Today's paper is titled, Iron Overload and Diabetes Risk, a shift from glucose to fatty acid oxidation and increased hepatic glucose production in a mouse model of hereditary hemochromatosis, which is a mouthful. But what we're looking at is the metabolic tendencies of mice genetically engineered for iron overload and the things that iron overload changes in the fundamental processes of metabolism. So this paper is examining a rather under-researched aspect of the iron overload diabetes connection. Now, for those unfamiliar with the history of iron overload and diabetes, I highly recommend that you check out the podcast, Diabetics for Diabetics Radio, where I talk extensively going through the historical research behind the connections, as well as the inner biological workings of iron, the molecule, and its place in our body systems, and how iron overload has huge connections to diabetes development, whether that be beta cell toxicity, uh, organ system dysfunction, and, and tissue destruction, and ultimately the diabetic state. This particular paper published in 2011 wanted to see how mice metabolism of both glucose and fatty acids changed in states with and without iron overload. Knowing how iron changes metabolisms sheds light on what changes are happening in the bodies of diabetics, as well as those in the early undetected stages of disease development. So let's dive into the details here. So this paper took two groups of mice, a control group with no changes made to the mice and a group of mice who were genetically modified to delete the gene commonly associated with the development of hereditary hemochromatosis. That's called the HFE gene. So these mice had no HFE gene and were therefore genetically inclined to over retain iron in their tissues. Those two groups of mice, the control and the HFE negative group, were both then slept separated again into a normal chow diet as well as a high fat diet. The normal chow diet fed to these mice is probably the human equivalent of a high carb, low fat diet with less than 4% of their calories for the day coming from a fat source. Now, the high fat diet was somewhere around 40% of their daily caloric intake coming from fat. So after a few weeks of feeding, the researchers looked at the two diets of the two different kinds of mice and measured the specific byproducts of their metabolism. So there are specific markers of glucose metabolism. There are also specific markers for fatty acid oxidation, which are mutually exclusive. So they looked at these mice in an overloaded, an iron overloaded state, as well as a normal state and said, okay, what's happening more here? Are they oxidizing more glucose? or are they oxidizing more fatty acid? And they were also testing for different markers here. One was for hepatic glucose output, which is the liver's output of glucose into the blood. This is very common in fatty acid oxidation where because the body itself isn't oxidizing glucose, the liver is responsible for releasing glucose into the blood. This is a very, very common uh, complication of type 2 diabetes. A lot of the common medications in circulation today, Ozempic, Trulicity, Metformin, those are all in place to manipulate the liver's glucose output. So they were looking at how the metabolisms of these mice were fostering that liver glucose output 
as well as things like uh, protein kinases, which are basically on-off switches for different uh, enzymes and metabolic processes, just seeing if there was any indication of what was changing and why. So now let's talk about the findings. The first finding was that in the skeletal muscle of iron overloaded mice, there was not a change in the glucose uptake of the tissue itself but there was a decrease in the glucose oxidation. So the muscle tissue of these mice were still taking in glucose, but they weren't using it. And to that point, with a decrease in glucose oxidation, there was an increase in fatty acid oxidation. So the ratio of fatty acid oxidation to glucose oxidation favored fatty acids. So in figure one, we are looking at the status of the HFE minus and the control groups in terms of their iron load and some of the downstream effects. So in A here, you can see that there's clear difference in the circulating ferritin levels between the HFE minus and the wild type. In this particular paper, they use serum ferritin as the indicator for iron load. We've talked about before how that isn't always accurate, but you can see here that there is a clear, clear difference. This is more than double um, the control group in terms of their ferritin levels. And then for B, when you are looking at uh, the black, that's the wild type, the HFE minus is the white. This is measuring the byproducts of glucose oxidation in both skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle from both types of mice. And you can see there is a big decrease in the levels of glucose oxidation happening in the iron overloaded mice. Same, uh, same comparison here for palmitate oxidation, which is a byproduct of fatty acid oxidation. You can see that there is a sl just about the same level of fatty acid oxidation, slight differences, a, a slight decrease in the iron overload. Um, we'll talk in a future figure about how mitochondrial respiration is slightly less efficient. So that could be an indicator for why that is. But the real thing and, and where B and C come together is actually looking at the ratio of fatty acid to glucose metabolism. And in the wild type, uh, the control group, you can see that the ratio of fatty acid to glucose metabolism is significantly lower than the iron overloaded group, saying that the iron overloaded group is metabolizing fatty acids significantly more than glucose. They also found that there were slight decreases in the rate of mitochondrial respiration in iron overloaded mice. So mice with too much iron had mitochondria that were not creating energy at the same levels as those in the control. So in figure two, we are looking at the oxygen consumption rates of the mitochondria in the wild type and the iron overloaded mice. State two, three, and four all correlate to different degrees of required oxygen, right? S simulating um, exertion, for example, where the harder you work, the more oxygen you're going to need. Now, in each of these stages, you can see that there is a slight difference between the control group in the black and the iron overload. Um, the paper authors went on to say that there is, you know, albeit not always significant, but there is a slight decrease in mitochondrial efficiency in terms of using oxygen. The researchers also found an increase in the protein kinase PDK4. Now, PDK4 is typically upregulated in high fat diets as well as fasting and is a tool our body has to decrease the oxidation of glucose, whether, be, whether because you're fasting and there isn't any available or you're taking in fat and it's a tool to help your body oxidize fat better than glucose metabolism. So it was interesting that in iron overloaded mice, they had an increase in that 
protein kinase responsible for switching from glucose to fatty acid oxidation. Now in figure three, we are looking at the different levels of a select group of protein kinases. Now, everything here kind of across the middle, the one is the ratio comparing wild type or control with the iron overload, right? So the closer to one, the more equal each of them were in each group. Now, the two that are elevated significantly are PDK4 and CPT1B. The paper decided to focus more on the aspects of PDK4 because of its ties to that conversion from glucose oxidation to fatty acid oxidation. Now, in B, this is looking at PDH activity. PDH stands for pyruvate dehydrogenase, I believe, which is a enzyme used in glucose metabolism in getting glucose, the, the byproducts of glucose into uh, cellular respiration. Now, PDK4 up here works opposite PDH. So the higher PDK4 is, the lower PDH activity is. And that was shown here uh, in that the control levels were somewhere between eight and nine. Iron overload was down but, uh, below six, between five and six. And then finally, there was an increase in the liver glucose output of iron overloaded mice. The livers of mice with excess iron in their skeletal tissue were producing and releasing more glucose than those of the control. So now, what does it all mean? Let's take what the paper showed us and transpose it over some previous research. Now, it's been well established that there is a connection between iron overload, iron dysregulation, mishandled iron recycling, and altered glucose metabolism and the eventual development of diabetes. The question is how and why? So in mice with too much stored iron in their tissue, glucose utilization decreased and the body showed an adaptive shift to prioritize fatty acid metabolism. The iron overloaded mice showed higher activity in all of the tools required for that body to make the shift from glucose to fatty acid oxidation. Now the authors of the study postulated that everything that they were seeing painted a picture comparable to the metabolic inflexibility that is common in type 2 diabetes, which is that the type 2 diabetes model is one that really only knows how to oxidize fat and is slowly unlearning how to properly utilize glucose. And then with the increased liver glucose output, typically associated with type 2 diabetes as well, the iron overloaded mice their livers were more active in releasing glucose into the bloodstream. This is a common feature of fatty acid oxidation because our body itself isn't taking in or properly utilizing glucose, the liver feels responsible for getting glucose into circulation to make sure that our cells have energy available. Now, the authors themselves and their research methods couldn't pinpoint exactly how or why this was happening, but it contributes to the body of work supporting the connections between iron overload and a lot of the symptoms being experienced by those with diabetes. So what does this mean for us and where do we go from here? For starters, it furthers the body of work going into the connections between iron overload and diabetes. There is clearly a mineral basis specifically related to iron recycling and some form of altered glucose metabolism, right? The more iron you have, the more dysfunctional your glucose metabolism is. How we go exactly about managing that iron effectively and some of the downstream and upstream effects of why that may be happening aren't crystal clear but it's clear to see that there is a connection that needs to be manipulated some way 
uh, to develop a therapy for handling diabetes. And then secondly, when you see how the body has systemically shifted away from glucose metabolism to fatty acid metabolism, for those with diabetes, looking, looking to and interested in regenerating beta cells, you have to consider what the stimuluses are for beta cell regeneration. One of those is being able to metabolize glucose, right? So you have to have glucose available to the cell to serve as a stimulus for the body to kind of get that machinery going again. Whereas if our body has completely shifted to fatty acid oxidation, there's no call for growth in the beta cell department because it has everything in place as an adaptive measure to metabolize and get by on fat without having to worry about that beta cell growth. And to that point, this paper does acknowledge it in its, in its conclusion, but it doesn't factor in that iron in excess is toxic to the cells themselves. So this is noting the metabolic shifts that are going on without actually focusing on the fact that while those metabolic shifts are going on, the iron is also being toxic to the beta cells and causing beta cells to slowly die off as this shift to fatty oxidation uh, is occurring. So iron is working on many different metabolic levels. Not only is it toxic to beta cells and increasing oxidative stress, tissue, a tissue and cell apoptosis, it's also shifting the fundamental chemistry of how our cells are obtaining energy, possibly in a way that is preventing regrowth and regeneration of the beta cells that we need to return to glucose metabolism. So in closing, this paper has led me to look for new ways to influence our metabolic flexibility. What are the things that my body needs to regulate iron? Whether that be increasing trace minerals to help counterbalance the iron abundance, whether it be offloading extra iron through chelation therapy or phlebotomy, what are ways that we can increase the counterbalance to iron and decrease that total volume of iron to kind of meet in the middle and allow us the space to allow our body to shift away from fatty acid oxidation back to glucose metabolism. And there you have it. All right. So thanks so much for reading along with me. I welcome you to read the paper as well. I've got it linked in the description below. Read it through. If you see something that I didn't or you have a different take than I do, feel free to comment. I, I want to start a discussion about all of this. And until next time, I will see you in our next diabetic research review. Thanks so much. Don't forget to share, subscribe, and save. I will see you next time.